good morning everyone so welcome for uh, welcome to this world ocean day uh, lecture and we all know that uh, this year's theme is uh, life and livelihood we have uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, scientist uh, dr chette here and i request uh, director in coys to deliver, uh, introduce the speaker and invite him for the lecture thank you uh, francis uh, good morning recording can see me recording recording can la recording can sorry so there was a feedback so let i'm uh, you know starting over again a bit of a technical issue i think uh, i'm audible now um so good morning uh, to our distinguished uh, speaker dr satish chete uh, colleagues uh, of uh, from moes and all the other moes institutions colleagues from incois early career ocean professionals and all participants who joined this event so today uh, the 8th of june is commemorated as the international world ocean day and uh, i wish all of you a, a happy international uh, world ocean day now world ocean day reminds everyone of the major role uh, the oceans have in everyday life and it's an opportunity for all of us uh, to inform the public on the impact of human actions on the ocean develop a worldwide movement of citizens uh, for the ocean and mobilize and unite the world's population on a screenshot combined initiative for sustainable management of the world's oceans uh we all know that oceans cover 70% of the planet and uh, it's our life source supporting humanity's sustenance and that of every other organism on the earth the oceans produce at least 50% of the planet's oxygen every second breath we take comes from the oceans um and it is a main source of protein for more than a billion people around the world oceans also absorb around 30% of the carbon dioxide produced by the humans buffering the impacts of global warming and not to mention the uh, ocean is the key to our economy with an estimated 40 million people being employed by ocean based industries by 2030 and that could be in fisheries transportation recreation medicines that is pharmaceuticals and the list goes on and more importantly uh, closer home to us uh, we know that uh, oceans impact they are the driving force for the monsoons they are the flywheel of uh, weather and climate and origin of hazards such as cyclone tsunamis and sea level rise even though uh, we have so many benefits from the oceans the ocean is now in need of support because the oceans have, and the and the resources are getting depleted uh, so we need to protect and preserve the oceans and all uh, the ocean sustains uh, we must create a new balance rooted in true understanding of the ocean and how humanity relates to it now this year theme the oceans life and livelihoods is uh, is very relevant to the activities that we do here at incois as most of you know incois uh, pursues activities on ocean observations modeling information and advisory services and uh, the uh, services that we provide like uh, potential fishing zones uh, the ocean state forecast uh, tsunami in terms of daily warning services etc they have huge uh, uh, socio economic benefits for a wide range of stakeholders and they enhance the lives and livelihoods of the coastal communities uh, with those few words uh, i'm really thankful and glad that dr satish chete a world renowned physical oceanographer who most of us know and he is also the chair of our research advisory council he has agreed to deliver a very important talk uh today on uh, physics of the ocean at india's doorstep i take this opportunity to introduce uh, dr satish chete dr satish ramnath chete has taken his masters degree in physics from the indian institute of technology mumbai in 1973 and his phd in physical oceanography from the university of washington he has done his postdoctoral research also in the university of washington before he moved back to india in 1982 to join the uh, CSIR National Institute of Oceanography he served CSIR National Institute of Oceanography in various capacities uh, including as a director uh, from uh, 2000 from the year 2004 uh, until in 2012 he was appointed as the vice chancellor of goa university though he officially retired from government uh, service in 2016 he continues to be in the active field of research and teaching 
and serves in many high level committees scientific committees uh, including the research advisory committee of incois we are very uh, honored to have him uh, as the chair of our rsc dr shetty is an outstanding researcher teacher and visionary who played a pivotal role in popularizing physical oceanography in the country with his unique and intuitive approach theory blended with observational evidences he analyzed the ocean observations from the coastal waters around india and discovered several facets of coastal circulation including the seasonal reversal of uh, uh, eicc and wicc associated with the monsoon circulation the east india and west india uh, coastal uh, currents uh, both their vertical and horizontal structures his extensive research paved way for a series of studies on slope and shelf circulation in our coastal waters uh, and its mathematical modeling Uh, Dr. Shetty uh, continues to motivate and ignite many young minds in the field of physical oceanography by posing several thought-provoking research problems to them and working with them to find solutions. Uh, several awards and hon- honors were bestowed upon Dr. Shetty: uh, Shanti Swarup Patnagar Award, elected fellow of all three science academies of India, fellow of the Indian Geophysical Union, MOS National Award for Ocean Science and Technology. New Millennium Science Medal of the Indian Science Congress Association, Distinguished Alumnus Award of the IIT Bombay. Bombay. There are just a few of them. And uh, Dr. Shetty uh, has published over 100 research papers in reputed SCI journals and guided several students. We are very happy to have you, Dr. Shetty, uh, giving us the talk uh, today. It's an honor. So I hand over to you to kindly deliver the talk. Over to you, Dr. Shetty. Uh, thank you, uh, Shrinivas. Can you hear me okay? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, it's a great honor uh, for me to deliver this uh, uh, lecture on uh, mm-hmm. World Oceans Day, which I understand is being celebrated uh, for the first time in Incois, and it's indeed a pleasure to give this uh, lecture. I uh, thank Director Incois. for this privilege and uh, look forward to uh, uh, sharing my thoughts on this uh, topic with you uh, also very nice to see uh, many of uh, colleagues at incois uh, attending this talk uh, i'm going to talk about uh, physics of the ocean at india's doorstep uh, let me explain what i mean by that uh we have looked at uh, india's ocean uh, indian ocean for a long time now uh, we have uh, uh, studied the indian ocean uh, very often when we study the indian ocean it means studying the large scale portion uh, its wind driven circulation and that is how uh, oceanography started in india it started with uh, Uh, international indian ocean expedition whose purpose was to understand the large scale circulation in the wide ocean now uh, things started changing after uh, the field matured in the country and after people started asking very specific questions like when will a storm surge arrive at uh, india's doorstep or india's coastline uh what will be the impact of a certain event uh on the in the wide ocean uh, on in the region of the shelf which is very often taken to be uh, less than 200 meters deep so when you ask this question it becomes necessary to ask how is the region close to the coastline different from the region in the open sea or is it different at all uh if it is different then what are the main differences between the two so in this talk i'm basically going to look at these two questions number one can we empirically without involving any models or anything uh distinguish between the dynamics over the large uh, uh large scale 
uh, circulation of uh, the Indian Ocean from the circulation which is on the shelf, which is just close to the coastline. And if we can distinguish it, what are the main distinctions between the two? So that is what I'm going to uh, be talking about. So let me start with a clip that uh, summarizes uh, the nature of winds over the North Indian Ocean. And uh, this, uh, is, uh, 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 this is a data set that was put together by Rizian and Chelton uh, using the scatterometer uh, data, uh, uh, some eight years of data or so. But what they did was, uh, what they did was, they uh, decomposed it into a mean field, an annual, a semi-annual, a four-monthly, and a three-monthly. So all that I've done is combined their coefficients to construct the field. As a result of which, it's very smooth. Sometimes it doesn't move at all. But then there are other occasions when you start these arrows uh, moving and the colors changing. Now, the arrows indicate the wind stress, uh, that, that is the stress which has been exerted on the ocean. Colors indicate the curl of the wind stress. Now, uh, color, this uh, curl is a scalar, but it is, over the open sea, it is uh, very effective in generating uh, motions primarily by triggering uh, Rossby waves and uh, uh, Kelvin waves uh, in the coastal areas uh, to create the circulation that we generally associate with the North Indian Ocean. Now, uh, so this is the large scale uh, circulation, uh, the large scale uh, variation uh, of, the, uh, of the winds. Now, in response to the large-scale uh, winds, the sea level uh, uh, changes. And uh, what you see here uh, is, uh, what I'm going to show you is just another clip, which uh, shows how the, uh, how the sea level anomaly over the Indian Ocean changes as a function of time during an annual cycle. Uh, so, uh, what you are looking at is ultimate data which has been processed to determine mean, uh, the, the, what is called the sea level anomaly or the variation of the sea level uh, during a year by constructing its climatology. So, uh, the Aviso data set uh, makes available daily values of ultimate uh, since 1993. So uh, Dr. Vinay Chandran of CAOS has looked at these daily values and assembled one data set, which goes from day one to day 365. It merely represents the average of a daily value during a period of about 22 years or so. So that is what I'm going to do now. The red colors in here represent the higher sea level, blue colors represent the lower sea level. And uh, once uh, you uh, start looking at the date is shown at the top uh, on the left hand side. So you see the sea level changing all the time in response to the changes that happen in the advective field, changes that happen uh, in uh, uh, development of certain areas that are known as highs or lows, like for example, in the vicinity of uh, southwest tip of India, uh, there is a high which forms during winter, a low which forms during uh, uh, summer, uh, known as the Lakshmidweep high and low. There are similar things which happen near uh, the uh, coast of uh, Somalia. So, uh, in response to the wind field, which I talked about earlier, there are things which happen to the ocean, and those today uh, can be looked at uh, via satellite technology. Uh, remember, 
that the data set which I used to describe the winds uh, was based on scatterometer, which is again uh, a satellite based product. Uh, the one which I'm showing you now is uh, altimeter, again a satellite based product. And uh, it uh, essentially means it is the new technology which is fueling uh, the, uh, the understanding of an ocean like the North Indian Ocean, because this is an ocean where everything changes with time during an annual cycle. One of the very uh, few parts of the uh, global oceans where things happen uh, seasonally uh, very prominently. So if you analyze this sort of data uh, and uh, look at uh, what it does, here is a schematic which summarizes uh, what all has been seen in the, uh, in the observations, uh, either satellite, hydrographic, current meters, and so on. Let me point out to you certain important features of this. Just a minute. Uh, certain important features. This is the East Indian coastal current on the eastern side. The West Indian coastal current. Uh, there is a Lakshadweep high and low which forms in this region. This is the Sri Lanka dome. And there are other currents. The Somali current, very complicated system. The Great World the Southern Gyre, the uh, Socotra ID, then just to the north of it is the East Arabian uh, uh, coastal current, or uh, East Arabian current. So the, these are features which uh, are all having uh, annual signal, and my next transparency makes that clear. Uh, listed on the first, uh, on the left-hand side, are the major currents of the North Indian Ocean. And by North Indian Ocean, I mean Indian Ocean maybe to the north of about uh, 10 degrees south. This is where you see a very distinct uh, annual cycle. Uh, listed here are the currents, and listed to the south of it are the highs and lows that form in the region uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier. Now, an interesting feature of this, uh, of this table is that except for the south equatorial current, which is uh, essentially to the south of about 10 degrees south, all other currents reverse direction. They either move north or south or east or west, but they have a, a typical annual cycle associated with them. Again, except for 5 to 10 degrees south reach, which more or less stays there, but changes only uh, in terms of its uh, uh, extent or uh, magnitude, but is there throughout the year. In contrast, all other features which are to the north of the south uh, of 5 to 10 degrees south reach all have an annual cycle. So this is the main point. Everything in the open North Indian Ocean has an annual cycle. So uh, this knowledge which has been generated over the last uh, uh, almost 50 years uh, is now uh, has helped us to understand the circulation over the open sea uh, reasonably well. And one of the most quoted uh, papers of uh, a summary of that is the Short and McCready paper of 2001. And they have shown that the wind stress and its curve, uh, which I showed in the clip earlier, produce Rossby waves and what are known as the beta plane Kelvin waves that set up the circulation, which I just uh, summarized and which was nice, uh, which was seen. Uh, uh, in terms of the sea level anomaly in the clip which I showed you. The important thing to note here is that there are, uh, there are uh, two uh, main carriers of information in the open sea, the Rossby waves and the Kelvin waves. Which of the two dominate depends on the period of the wave. And for each period, 
there is a critical latitude. A Kelvin wave will exist only to the north of that latitude, whereas a Rossby wave will exist only to the south of that latitude. Now, when you look at the annual circulation, the critical latitude uh, stays beyond the northern boundary of uh, the uh, North Indian Ocean, as a result of which most of the features that we see are associated with the Rossby waves, except in uh, one or two cases when uh, there is a zonal boundary where a Kelvin wave can exist. But without getting into those uh, details, uh, one can, uh, for the kind of a clip which I showed you uh, uh, of the sea level anomaly, most of the features can be understood in terms of an annual Rossby wave because this is a climatology and annual uh, signature is highlighted. Uh, keep in mind, however, that uh, when you look at the data for a particular year, you will see uh, many other uh, frequencies present and then corresponding Rossby waves and Kelvin waves will come into play. Now, this whole framework that uh, uh, helps us to understand uh, these things assumes that uh, the boundaries of the North Indian Ocean form a vertical wall and it is against that wall that the Rossby waves and the Kelvin waves propagate. Uh, reality is a little different. Uh, there are no vertical walls in the ocean. Uh, at the edge of uh, the North Indian Ocean, you find a continental slope and a continental shelf. That is this LO area, which is uh, less than about approximately uh, 200 meters or so. The deep ocean is of the order of 3,000 or 4,000. So we are looking, this LO area is uh, the region that we call the shelf. Now, what happens on the shelf? Do these large scale waves that I just described to you also play a role on the shelf or some equivalent of those waves come and play a role? Uh, uh, this question is really a very essential question if you want to understand uh, this LO area where most of the operational uh, activities or commercial activities and as uh, uh, Srinivas pointed out, there are about 40 million people uh, who are dependent on uh, this area for their livelihood. Uh, how, what is the physics uh, over the shelf in comparison to the physics over the blue area, which is the open uh, sea? And this question could have been easily answered if we had put, uh, say, current meters on the shelf and maybe continue them through the slope or, or, over the uh, abyssal plain. Now, uh, only difficulty doing this is uh, shelf is a very busy region. It supports our navigational routes, uh, fishing areas, and uh, deployment of moorings uh, for a long period uh, is either problematic because you just lose those through uh, because of dredging uh, by fishing or any other uh, marine activity, or sometimes it is outright illegal to do it. And as a result, this question, how is the shelf physics different from the open sea physics uh, has not really received the attention it deserves. However, in the literature, you often find tacitly assume that what happens in the open sea happens on the shelf. And uh, nonetheless, it is important to answer this question because uh, most of the institution like INCOI's primary activity is located on the shelf. And uh, for uh, such institutions, uh, you need to know uh, what is the nature of, uh, uh, of the circulation. Now, fortunately, MOES has been installing high-frequency radars along the coastline, and they can measure currents at the surface uh, remotely uh, over something like 200, uh, kilo uh, 200 kilometers. Uh, here, 
so one such installation, uh, the high frequency radar, uh, there are three such radars on the East Coast, and the one which is at Kudalore and Kalpakam uh, is the one which is shown, uh, the site of which is shown here. This is just the blow up of that area. The radar generally, gen, uh, the radar, the high frequency radar consists of two installations uh, which uh, emit and receive uh, radio frequencies, high frequency radio uh, waves, uh, with the help of which you can estimate uh, quite reliably uh, velocity uh, at each of these uh, dots, the blue dots which are seen here. Uh, data collected allows hourly velocity with a resolution of about six kilometers uh, over a distance of about 200 kilometers. That is from the coastline to about, uh, about here. So uh, what uh, I'm going to talk today is basically use this uh, data in order to uh, understand how circulation over the deeper region varies from, uh, is different from the circulation over the shallow region. And in this case, 200, uh, 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 200 meter depth is taken as the shelf break or the region which separates the shelf uh, from uh, the uh, open sea. Uh, virtually everything which I'm uh, talking here uh, on this topic today is uh, the, uh, comes from a paper which has recently been uh, uh, published by Bishwamoy, uh, uh, Balaji, Arya, Francis, and myself uh, in uh, continental shelf research, and it highlights certain features which I will be talking. Now, those of you who have read the title who probably know what I'm going to point out is the annual cycle which is seen everywhere in the open sea is absent on the shelf. And that, in fact, was a rather surprising uh, result. And I will explain how, uh, how that inference uh, was derived. Now, just to put the, the region in perspective, uh, I'll be talking about the region here of uh, Kudalore uh, and Kalpakam. Along the, uh, the reach, uh, along the shelf and the slope of this region, uh, we generally associate the East India Coastal Current. Uh, this current is strongest and southward from uh, approximately August to January. There is a strong uh, southward signal that you can see during this time. Uh, it is northward uh, and quite strong during March and April. Uh, that is what you see here. And it's somewhat weak during May to July. So that is the overall large scale feature that, uh, that I talked about earlier. What happens uh, on the shelf at this time? So uh, that that is what we will be doing by first comparing the data at 50 meter depth with the data at approximately 70, 1700 meter depth uh, using this uh, data set. The shallow area, what we call the shelf current, is located 20 kilometers from the coastline and has a depth of 50 meters, whereas the deeper area uh, what we call the slope current uh, is located 60 kilometers from the coastline and in a depth of about uh, 1700 meters. Uh, this is the raw data set in which the left hand side shows the alongshore current. And the, so uh, let me go back. Uh, notice this red line which is shown here. So, what has been done is the currents which have been measured in the vicinity of that line have been decomposed into an alongshore component, which is along the line perpendicular to this and along cross shore component, which is the component along uh, this line. 
So we will basically be making use of the alongshore component because that is the main direction in which uh, the coastline uh, runs. So what, what, what is shown in the next picture is how the alongshore component raw data looks during two years, 2017, 2018. So that is another interesting feature of uh, the installation, HFR uh, installation. It gives you uh, data over a long period of time. Now, uh, so I will be mainly looking at the alongshore component, which is uh, on the left-hand side, and uh, look at it a little differently. Uh, let us look at the 100-day low-past data uh, 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 using the the, uh, the alongshore and the crossshore component. Now, this is the alongshore component, certainly much more energetic than the crossshore. This is 100-day low-past filtered uh, data. It therefore tells you only the seasonal cycle. And what you see is uh, the data set, uh, which is which produces a northward current is shown uh, with a, a red line. The southward current, which is most energetic in the later half of the year, in fact, towards the end of the year, uh, January, uh, December, November, December, January or so, uh, is what is represented by blue lines. You do find that the current sometimes goes onto the shelf, but the shelf is approximately 200 meters, which is right here. But most of the time, it is confined to the slope area between 1,000 and 2,500 meters, shown with these dark lines. We have taken the current at 1,700 meters as the typical, and the current at 50 meter depth as the typical on the shelf. So you find that typically on the shelf, you don't see the what is seen as the slope current. There are occasions when the slope current migrates and disturbs the shelf region. But in general, that is not the case. There is the, the main, the open sea current seems to confine itself to the slope area. In other words, the continental slope is the one which uh, stands as the vertical wall, which I talked to you uh, a little earlier. The, it is there that the boundary of the large scale circulation forms. There are exceptions. There are times when that boundary current encroaches onto the shelf. But in general, there is a clear distinction between the shelf break, uh, and uh, which serves as the boundary of the open sea circulation and the region between the coastline and the shelf break. So uh, what is the major feature that you see? The blue line is the, uh, the current which has been low past filtered, 100 day filtered, uh, and which is seen over two years, January 2017 to 2018. This is the current over 1700 meters. The green line is the current over the 50 meter depth. And the most surprising uh, uh, to us when we were analyzing this data was there is hardly any correlation between 1700 meter current and the 50 meter current. Even though the two currents are separated merely by a distance of 40 kilometers, you know, which is quite small. It is of the order of the radius of deformation, uh, one of the length scales which are often used in understanding uh, features in the oceans. The other feature that you see is uh, the dashed line here shows the wind stress, uh, alongshore uh, wind stress along the eastern coast of India. And that seems to be a reasonably good relationship between the blue line and the dashed red line, which means the large scale current is, seems to be responding to what the uh, large scale winds are doing, but the current on the shelf 
is doing something else. This is not correlated with the blue line, which is the current, nor is it correlated with the dashed red line, which is the local uh, wind stress. The same thing can be seen if you do a wavelength analysis on the uh, uh, slope current and the shelf current. Left hand side is the slope current and you see a very distinct uh, long term uh, half a uh, semi annual annual signal appearing here. But on the shelf current, the semi annual, in fact, as a matter of fact, anything longer than about 50 days is not present on the shelf. That is, which is distinctly different from what you see on the slope. <clears throat> I think this is uh, one of the most important results to come out of uh, the uh, HF radar uh, data and uh, wealth were well worth the investment because it could not have been done uh, by any other instrumentation. Looking at it a little more in greater detail is uh, this uh, uh, figure which shows you how the strength or the amplitude of the current varies as a function of distance from the coastline and as a function of periodicity. So close to the coastline, which is over a depth of less than about 200 meters, where the slope is very small on the shelf, you find very small energy and none of it is in the long period range. Only when you come to periods less than about 50 meters or so, you find some energy and that too uh, confined to the shelf break. You don't find anything which is very close to the coastline. And I think this was the main message to come out of this entire analysis. And it tells you that we must now look for what is the nature of, the, uh, uh, of uh, what happens on the shelf uh, from what happens on the slope and the deep sea. Now, in the open sea dynamics, we have seen that on the slope and the deep sea, we have the Rossby and the beta plane Kelvin waves operating as the main carriers of information. It turns out that in on the shelf, the main carriers of information are what are known as the coastally trapped waves or their cousins, barotropic version, continental shelf waves, which are very strongly attached uh, and dependent on the topography of the region. It turns out they are also uh, very strongly dependent on the nature of friction in the region. It is because of these two things that friction and the characteristics of the continental uh, shelf waves or costly trapped waves that the maximum in amplitude of a current does not remain close to the coastline but shifts farther towards the, uh, uh, towards the open deeper region. And a longshore component of the wind stress is the main driver of these waves. Now, I mentioned to you the curl of wind stress and the wind stress uh, itself drives the Rossby waves and the Kelvin waves. Here, we have the longshore component of the wind stress as the main driver to drive the, the continental shelf waves or the coastally trapped waves. So this is the main difference. Now what was surprising was that even though the coastal region of India has a very distinct annual cycle that you see here, this is a region which covers uh, six years uh, of data and you uh, very distinctly see uh, six annual cycles present here. This is present on the shelf that the shelf comes under the influence of, of this wind stress. And as you saw from the data, you don't see an annual cycle. It's very weak in comparison to the smaller frequencies, uh, in comparison to the higher frequencies, five days, 10 days, which are also present 
in the data. But these are the ones which selectively appear on the shelf and the longer frequencies don't appear. That is the reason why shelf has often been called a high pass filter. It skips only the uh, uh, higher frequencies and lets out the lower frequencies uh, or makes them not appear in the shallow area. So where do they go? Let me answer that question uh, in a moment. Let me just point out now that the dynamic shifts uh, from the open region to uh, the, uh, the shelf region because of two main factors, the ones which are pointed out by uh, these arrows. One is edge, the change in topography becomes important. The second is a presence of a friction term in the basic uh, uh, dynamics. Now, while the history of shelf waves, uh, shelf waves goes back to 1960s, these two points, what, do, what does friction do to these waves, uh, was pioneered uh, by Powers et al. in 1989, first paper came out. Brink has been, had been working on this problem earlier, and I think the most important paper from the point of view of what I've just talked about uh, is in 2006, where uh, he pointed out uh, why, what happens when uh, even though you have long term, uh, you have long period winds, they don't appear on the shelf. So what happens to it? Uh, the answer is given in this figure, which is taken from uh, Brink 2006. If you have long periods driven by uh, or, or on the shelf, of course, there are currents which form, but they tend to have a form in which appears primarily, its amplitude appears primarily on the slope, and you don't see anything significant on the shelf itself. That is what happens to the annual cycle of wind stress which drives an annual current. It appears in the deeper areas, and you don't see a significant signature in the shallow areas. Whereas, if you have short period forcing, the same peak, which was now sitting in the deep areas, appears a little closer to the coastline, and that is the reason why you see those uh, 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 those having an influence, but with lower energies, but having an influence in uh, on the shelf. So this is the reason why uh, you don't see uh, the the lower frequencies appearing. On, uh, on the shelf, uh, the, you, all that you see are the low period uh, motions. So, uh, uh, in essence, uh, a schematic of the region uh, would mean that coastally trapped waves are the main carriers of information here, but the ones which will appear here have periods less than about 50 days or so, at this particular coastline. At other coastlines, things could be different. There is a shelf break, there is a boundary current, the EICC in this region. But coastally trapped waves with periods which are higher than 50 days merge into them rather than appearing on the shelf. So on the shelf, you don't see them at all. And I think that is the main reason why uh, uh, the shelf has never been associated with very uh, uh, long period uh, motions worldwide. And uh, I, I think this is something that our oceanography has to keep in mind. Uh, so at the start of this talk, uh, I pose two questions. Uh, can we empirically distinguish between physics of Indian Ocean's large scale wind-driven circulation from the Indian Ocean's uh, uh, circulation on the shelf, which is uh, next to it, at its doorstep? Uh, and if yes, what is the main difference between the two? Uh, uh, I think we have answered this question. Uh, the, the main difference is the, the data. I think uh, our results need to be uh, scrutinized using longer time series 
using other data. You know, I think India has about uh, five or maybe six uh, installations. In particular, uh, we have picked up this region that allowed us to look at the shelf, the slope, and the abyssal region. Uh, that is because the shelf here is very narrow, uh, only about uh, 30, 30 km, kilometers or so wide. But uh, there is uh, the Bombay High Region, a region which is 300, 400 kilometers uh, wide shelf, an extremely important, commercially extremely important region. There is uh, a high frequency radar station sitting in this area. And I think it's important that we examine uh, those currents to see what is the implication of uh, what we have discussed here, the shelf waves and so on. It is also a region about, uh, we, we don't know anything about the wind-driven circulation of that region. And therefore, HFR uh, stations do offer a new uh, uh, prospect as far as understanding that very important area is concerned. Uh, of course, equally important are the methods of representing uh, friction in models that we that are used uh, to uh, study these uh, regions. Uh, let me for, for the first time to observe surface velocity on the shelf and slope simultaneously over a long period of time has helped to show that only the low frequencies, that is the periods larger than about uh, 50 days uh, 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 will appear on the slope and deeper areas. On the shelf, we will only see uh, the higher frequencies, periods, uh, 10 days, 20 days, and so on. This result to us was a little surprising because uh, it was surprising because there was a forcing function right in the shelf. And, and therefore, the uh, contention was somehow it should show up on the shelf. Uh, it turns out it doesn't show up on the shelf because the dynamics, the dynamics underlining the uh, shelf waves uh, pushes the maximum of the velocity it generates in the slope area away from the shelf. And uh, this is something which we should uh, uh, study, we should uh, uh, examine uh, quite uh, extensively with these new data sets because this is the region which is important uh, where most of India's uh, uh, India's commercial activity occurs. So with that, uh, let me uh, thank uh, Incois, uh, its director, for the invitation to talk to you. Uh, let me also thank my uh, the colleagues uh, from INCOIS who worked on this problem. Uh, Bishwamoy, uh, Balaji, uh, Arya Paul, uh, Francis, uh, uh, and it was a pleasure working with them on this problem. And uh, thank you everybody who attended this talk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shete, for that wonderful talk. In fact, you explained so lucidly, you know, the dynamics on the shelf. I mean, which which is really our backyard. Uh, and with all the ocean forecasting and modeling that we are all doing, it is so very important that we understand these, uh, you know, uh, these processes uh, well. And then. Uh, the, the new kind of observational systems uh, that are actually being put in place, uh, you know, the HF radars and then the, the coastal current meter moorings, HF radars, for example, the National Institute of Ocean Technology, they puts in them and then there are plans to expand this observational network and then the, the coastal current meter moorings that are actually deployed by NIO and uh, these kind of new observational systems that are coming in, I think we should uh, be able to make use of these data sets. Uh, and then, uh, you know, enhance our capability to understand these processes. And then most importantly, 
parameterize these processes into high resolution coastal models that we are actually running because the output of those models is what finally gets into the uh, you know the generation of the advisories and all that so thank you very much for the very nice talk and i'll request francis to kind of uh, please uh, um, check on the chat and then see whether we have any questions uh, for uh, dr shete uh, thank you sir thank you um, dr srinivas there are a few questions uh, from the uh, youtube uh, viewers one question is um, whether we can uh, say something about the fish catch it shouldn't have said uh, based on the you know coastal circulation so uh, i think you can uh, take up that question if you wish then i will prompt the next question uh, okay first of all uh, i am not an expert on this so uh, take anything i say with a pinch of salt uh, uh, my feeling is that uh, uh, we have looked at fisheries from the point of view of open sea uh, circulation we talk in terms of upwelling downwelling uh, taking place uh, under the scenario of the open sea circulation so i think uh, what is important is if the shelf forms the ground for fisheries Uh, these processes will need to be examined from the point of view of uh, shelf dynamics uh, uh, for example there is no annual cycle so but in fisheries you do see an annual cycle i uh, to my understanding so uh, sir so some of these topics will need to be understood uh, from the point of view of what happens on the shelf and i i don't think i can uh, say more on this topic topic than that uh thank you the next question is that whether we we can make uh, similar conclusions based on satellite observations why do we want to depend only on hf yeah uh so i looked at uh, the satellite observations like for example the sea level anomalies which i uh, uh, showed you in a clip earlier and uh, my uh, sort of inference was that uh, it uh, tells you uh, what happens in the deep sea uh, happens on the shelf in maybe in a little modified fashion i think that is a problem of uh, the averaging which is done to prepare these uh, daily uh, products even though they have a nominal a uh, resolution of a uh, quarter of degree 25 kilometers or so uh, i think they don't really uh, quite resolve because you saw how dramatically different uh, the current on 50 meters uh, depth was from 1700 meters even though the distance between the two was only of the order of 40 kilometers uh, this sort of things i have not seen being shown in the altimeter data so i think uh, probably the resolution is not enough but then you could take you could make use of a long track data uh, going back to the raw data set and infer something uh, yeah, but that's uh, that's something which needs to be done thank you uh, another question is that okay now we are depending on uh, hf radar which sees only the surface of the ocean so what could be the vertical uh, part of this do we still yeah. miss annual cycle in the vertical yeah so you know that is the reason why i showed that uh, theoretical uh, figure uh, that appears in brings 2006 paper uh, when you have uh, a l- long period oscillation producing a shelf wave uh, its uh, primary signature appears in the slope as a bottom trapped wave you know its uh, uh, its uh, signature was not even felt at the surface it is trapped to the slope region uh, it is only when you have high, higher frequencies periods of the order of 10 days and 20 days that these bottom trapped waves appear in a shallow area and because they are in the shallow area they start making 
uh, and uh, uh, signature, uh, producing a signature at the surface. So uh, we don't know. We, we, at the moment, we don't have any uh, uh, any uh, uh, means of looking at the bottom trapping of these waves. But I think uh, it is some of the things which could be done by using the data from the moorings on the slope, uh, which uh, NIO has been operating for quite some time. The original intent of, the, of those moorings was to have them on the shelf and the slope. Uh, but then uh, logistics of uh, putting them on the shelf became so very difficult that they have remained mainly on the slope. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I think uh, one needs to look at uh, what happens below. We only know from theory what is to be expected, uh, that they will appear as shelf trapped, uh, they will appear as bottom trapped, uh, they will not be seen at the surface uh, on the slope area, but their surface signature will be seen in the shallow area. But this is something which needs to be confirmed. It's only in the model studies at the moment. Okay, just uh, one more question. Um, see, when you showed this uh, time series of uh, band, uh, band past uh, wind stress and then uh, the currents in the slope and the shelf. You mentioned that the uh, you know, slope or the open ocean circulation follows uh, fairly closely with the uh, wind stress uh, uh, time series. But still we see a kind of lead lag. Sometimes it doesn't uh, follow that lead. So how do you explain that? Yeah, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, you are looking at uh, a process uh, which is uh, uh, which involves other areas of the ocean. Okay, for example, uh, the water forces, the East India Coastal Current, has been examined in great detail. Uh, uh, you know, there are a couple of papers. Uh, uh, one of them, particularly, uh, the first one was by Shankar et al. The next one was uh, by McCready et al. Uh, the McCreary et al. paper looked at what drives the EICC and there were four different components which came uh, from it. One was equatorial influence. The second was uh, influence of winds uh, away from the uh, east coast of India, say uh, winds in Andamans. They would trigger waves which would then have an impact on the coastal areas of India. Uh, there is, of course, the local uh, forcing, uh, which is what I talked about. And the fourth one is the open sea forcing, which is in stress curl triggering. So it's very difficult. If you look at that figure, which I showed you, you sometimes feel the current forms before the winds come in. But uh, you have to keep in mind that you are looking at uh, uh, only in winds, you look at one of the four forcings. There are three others which have been left out uh, in, in that picture. Okay, so yes, you do need to take all those things into account. If you want to show a causal uh, cause behind the nature of uh, what I showed you. Thank you, sir. Um, I may request our colleagues from inquiries who are on live, uh, if they have any questions, please prompt. Ah, uh, is, Allah is putting it. Yeah, tell me. Yes, sir. Sir, your uh, results are uh, very impressive, but I think equally worrying for me because uh, uh, we have to give this uh, operational forecast for the currents. Now, as you know that recently we have a, a mis uh, accident in the of uh, Mumbai area. So I think uh, in their uh, industry, I think offshore industry is uh, depending upon uh, high resolution forecasting system for uh, of, uh, of India for the industries. So my worry is actually the uh, whatever the uh, uh, model setup what we have for the open ocean doesn't uh, uh, 
called the good for the coastal area as you know that it is mainly the coastally trapped waves which is uh, i think it is not uh, go along with the open ocean waves so according to you when we want to make a high resolution uh, uh, forecasting system for the coastal area what we have to uh, uh, really look for uh, okay uh, let me put it this way the moment you go uh, with a high resolution general ocean circulation model uh, shelf waves will be automatically taken into account okay uh, the, the dynamics uh, will uh, take them into account okay they will be seen only in the shallow areas where there is a change in bottom topography so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, not including shelf waves explicitly in a circulation model they, they are the basic fundamental uh, formulation of the model itself will allow shelf waves to propagate so if you have a good enough uh, resolution uh, model now uh, c keep in mind that the uh, resolution changes quite dramatically once you go from the open sea uh, to the shallow areas if you have a resolution which is fine enough to take that into account uh, i don't think you need to worry about it. okay sir uh, one more question for us actually uh, for you what will you would have seen the uh, oh, oscar what areas current, as what, what current turbidity current turbidity yes. currents yes yes yeah. So, uh, is this kind of a coastally trapped waves or the shelf waves, what you are telling, whether it has any relation to this uh, turbidity current? Because you know that the turbidity, uh, turbidity currents make a uh, lot of havoc for the uh, subsurface uh, installations like uh, uh, rigs or uh, the uh, cables like that. Is there any relation you could uh, see or uh, you know that? Well, uh, uh, you know, I showed you uh, the two pictures uh, from, but model studies uh, from Brings okay. paper, and uh, they were bottom trapped. Uh, so uh, I think this is something which we need to study. Uh, we have never recorded these bottom trapped currents so far, so it's very difficult to speculate about them or or their impact on the installations. But uh, at least that theoretical picture shows that if you have an installation uh, on that slope, uh, then uh, you better know what is the velocity of those uh, of those bottom trapped waves. Yes, this is something which we uh, need to worry about. This is something which we have not worried about so far. Only good thing is if you have a good resolution model then they would have produced those waves. And I'm sure petrochemical companies, before investing their money in those installations in the deep sea, uh, would have taken the care to uh, carry out these exercises. Otherwise, they are not going to invest billions of dollars there. You know. But uh, these are things that we need to worry about. Yes, Sudhir. Good afternoon, sir. Actually, yeah, I was having a question regarding your two movies. So in the first yeah. movie, you had shown that uh, wind stress variability and which is not uh, similar for all seasons. There will be some places where it is almost like constant and some places there is a you no know, more significant variability. But whereas in the uh, sea level changes, that's like more, more or less continuous. So is there any seasonal partitioning of energy which is going to the sea level like some season the wind is playing a role and other seasons they are not like that significant is there any partitioning of energy happening yes there? yes yes you remember i pointed out about that data set that data set consists of a mean an annual a semi-annual a four monthly and a three monthly uh, uh, period okay so uh, it does not include, it does not include, uh, Sudhir, uh, are you saying something? I, uh, I no, actually, no, 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 actually that is because of the lag. <laughs> you, okay, okay. I can see that okay, I have right. fixed in after I stopped. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, you can sir, switch you off can, your video. You can switch yeah, off you, your video, Sudhir. 
so that it will not be confusing. <laughs> okay. okay, Dr. Sete can unshare your PPT if you wish. Uh, should I unshare it? Yes, or yes, you can. If you can unshare it now. So that is, I uh, uh, press the cross button, right? Yes, yes, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, uh, uh, so the wind the data set, as I pointed out, consisted of a mean, a annual, semi-annual, four monthly, and a three monthly uh, oscillation. Whereas the real wind actually, and the real sea level consists of many other frequencies, uh, modern junior oscillations, for example, uh, 10 to 20 days uh, uh, bi -week, quasi bi-weekly oscillations. All of them have been systematically filtered out of the wind data just to highlight the seasonal cycle or the annual cycle. Whereas in case of the uh, sea level anomaly, it is just an average of uh, uh, a particular days uh, during a 20 year time span. Okay, so they, that move, removal of the high frequencies is not as efficient as what was done in the SCOW data set. That was the one which Rizian and uh, Shelton put together. That is the difference between the two. And I think if you <clears throat> looked at the long time series of sea level anomaly and did the same kind of an analysis, you would also see uh, such slow variations. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, we have one more um, uh, question from YouTube viewers. Um, it's I, th I think part of it you have already answered. Whether we can see similar uh, seasonal uh, structure in the uh, shelf waves, uh, shelf currents in the West Coast. So, if you would like to quickly answer to that. Well, I would love to see similar structure on the West Coast. Only thing is, we need data. Uh, in, particularly, we need data of, at an installation which covers the shelf, the slope, and the abyssal, uh, uh, abyssal region. Uh, problem on the west coast is shelf is quite wide, and uh, yeah, it's maybe towards the south uh, of the coastline, uh, you could have an installation which covers these three regions. Uh, uh, at Bombay, it is uh, absolutely not possible because that shelf itself is uh, some 400 kilometers wide. Uh, but uh, it would still be useful to look at uh, the data uh, from the high frequency radar in the Bombay High, uh, uh, which is located somewhere in the vicinity of Bombay, to simply know what is the nature of wind driven circulation there. Uh, we don't have any information about it at the moment. And if those data are analyzed, that would be the first time direct observations over a uh, reasonably uh, long, uh, reasonably large uh, area uh, would allow you to see what is the nature of uh, wind driven circulation. So I, I would strongly recommend in COIS to invest. Uh, uh, considerable amount of, uh, I mean, not considerable, whatever they can spare in uh, looking at uh, HF radar data acquiring as well as analysis. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. I think I'm, uh, I, we don't have any more questions. That was a very wonderful talk. And in fact, we, know, we all know that modeling of shelf currents is something which is very important for inquiries and our users. So this is a very useful talk for us. Uh, so now if, um, we have some um, uh, small uh, program which is organized by our early career uh, you know, oceanographers from the country. There is a small group of these people. So I will uh, invite uh, uh, Ms. Sunanta Narayanan from IIT Karakpur to give a brief on um, this particular group and their activity. They have conducted a painting competition and we will be um, you know, uh, exhibiting it here and uh, uh, publishing the winners. 
and also they have some uh, prepared some small video of you know this uh, researchers uh, activities so i will ask uh, um, uh, sunanta to explain a bit about that thank you sir good afternoon chetty sir good afternoon all of you uh, so i'll just uh, introduce I, i'll just uh, talk about what is eco so early career ocean professionals are a group of young researchers and scientists who are early in their careers in oceanography and elite fields the decade 2021 to 2030 is declared as the un decade of ocean science for sustainable development by the united nations the vision of the decade is the science we want for the ocean we want so on this world ocean day june 8 we would like to introduce the ecops working across india and their contributions which will lead to the achievement of the un decade ocean goals a video comprising researchers across india and their answer to how they can contribute their research towards these goals was compiled with inputs from various institutes an art contest was also conducted and circulated among kids elders to showcase their talents and the theme of the competition was what this ocean mean to you the responses were overwhelming the kids aged between 5 and 15 and elders aged between 15 and 30 have sent their responses we have selected three winners from each category although each entries are unique and innovative we request dr srinivas kumar director of inquiries to announce the winners of the art contest thank you very much uh, uh, sunanda ms sunanda and uh, we are uh, very glad that in course it is very glad that uh, you know the ecops have put together this uh, art competition and the video that we'll be sh uh, seeing sh shortly um, and of course also uh, we appreciate that uh, ecops have a big role to play in the you know uh, oceanographic research in the country Uh, you know you are the future of uh, you know the ocean research and services and everything in the country and of course as part of the un decade of ocean science for sustainable development you have a major role to play um so i will i'm happy to uh, announce the uh, uh, the art exhibition uh, winners in the children's uh, category the first prize uh, goes to sabarish uh, krishnan uh, who is a 14 year old um, uh, youngster from chennai so first prize sabarish krishna and the second prize goes to vidyut krishna who is again a 30 year uh, 13 year old child from chennai that is vidyut krishna second prize and the third prize uh, goes to shanti krishna uh, shanti krishna uh, a seven year old kid uh, uh, shanti krishna now uh, so those are the uh, the their entries that you are seeing in the uh, powerpoint that is being played uh, in the in the youtube uh, link and going to the elders category we have uh, first prize by uh, mr rahul pr uh, who is from the mit institute of design from pune rahul pr congratulations and then the second prize uh, tom elias Uh, who is a phd scholar from nit surat kal um, tom elias uh, second prize and the third prize uh, goes to uh, maria babu uh, who is an mtech student from kufos so maria babu so congratulations uh, to all the winners in both categories the children's category and the elders category uh, thank you very much thank you uh, dr srinivas now uh, we will play this small video it may take about 8 minutes uh, of the uh, early career researchers of uh, india across the subcontinent young professionals are working on myriads of proposals in the field of ocean and atmosphere we ecops has one aim supporting ocean based livelihoods through our research and contributing towards a sustainable blue economy hi i'm sunanda i'm an early career ocean professional from india on this world ocean day I would like to introduce some of the ecops from various institutions in India. My name is Trishnita Bhattacharya and I am an ocean modeler. I study the response of biogeochemistry of the Indian Ocean to tropical cyclones. 
My work aims to achieve a more predicted ocean so as to be able to protect the coasts from repeated destruction. Hello, I'm Shambhrita Ghatta. I broadly work on intraseasonal oscillations over Indian Ocean. So these are systems uh, born over Indian Ocean, uh, interacts with the ocean and most of them ultimately move towards the coast. Also for its connection to tropical cyclones, there is a potential of uh, better prediction of tropical cyclones and prediction with much longer lead time uh, using uh, the understanding of these systems. Hi, I am Ardra. I was graduate in oceanography from the Department of Physical Oceanography. Hydroxyl radical is one of the major oxidant in the lower troposphere and it is known as the cleansing agent of atmosphere. In this study, we have analyzed the distribution of OH radicals over Indian Ocean and we have found a seasonal OH minimum over Indian Ocean. Hi, I am Gubi Krishnan. My broad area of research includes the impact of atmospheric pollution over the Indian Ocean. Our findings reveal an alarming increase in the amount of formaldehyde over the Indian Ocean and this was among the top 5 most polluted shipping tracks of the globe. In order to reduce this, we recommend the better quality fuels and strict regulations for shipping emissions since 80% of the international trade is through the sea and this is expected to increase by 2 times in 2030 and by 4 times by 2050. I am Adira Krishnan, a research scholar from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. My broad area of research is climate change impact on wind waves and I will contribute my research towards a pretty ocean. Hello everyone, my name is Femi Thomas. I am an Arctic researcher, which is as interesting as it sounds. Over the decades, it's been known that Arctic is warming at alarming rate. This has got global significance because of its impacts such as sea ice decline, glacier melting, permafrost thawing, etc. I am an ecologist looking at the bacterial diversity and its interaction with environmental contaminants like metals in different ecosystems like glaciers and fjords in Arctic, trying to understand ecosystem responses towards climate change using microorganisms. My name is Gayatri Iliam. My work focuses on Antarctica's interactions on the global climate during the past and present times using Antarctic ice core records and surface temperature measurements. This work will contribute towards a better understanding of Antarctica's impact on the sea level rise, which is a dreadful consequence of global warming. Hi, I am Ashwati Das. My area of research is on coastal and open ocean interaction in Antarctica. Hi, I am Atulia. My broad area of research includes Arctic precipitation and how different ocean atmosphere parameters influence them. The research definitely addresses climate change as well as extreme precipitation events. I am Rohit Balakrishnan. I work on sea level variability, particularly mass redistribution in the ocean. We discovered a base impact sea level variability in the tropical Indian Ocean posed by Madame Julie Population. This work got published in Nature Communications, which earned me with two prestigious awards. Young Scientist Award 2020 from World Meteorological Organization and Eugene Lafour Medal 2019 from IAPSO. Currently, we are exploring the implications of oceanic mass redistribution on the rate of Earth's rotation. My name is Vikram. I am a postgraduate at Andhra University. I built ocean robots and observatory systems for ocean monitoring and research. It helps to monitor the ocean environment and ecosystem continuously in real time. These ocean robots travel the longer distance into the ocean and collect the real time in situ data for better forecast and to understand the ocean process. In this way, ocean robots and observatory systems helps to monitor our oceans. My name is Apurva P. Joshi. My broad area of research is modeling of ocean acidification scenarios. My research would be contributing to predictive oceans. Mithila Varnavi and I am dealing with one such variability in ocean known as mesoscale variability. Broadly speaking, my basic topic includes studying the dynamic nature of ocean using different models. Hi everyone. I'm Prisha Matthew. I work on marine biogeochemistry, particularly the biogeochemical variability of Indian Ocean using observations and numerical models. My name is Ronnie Peter. My broad area of research is Indian Ocean carbon cycle and global warming. I work towards a productive ocean. My name is Vivek Selenki. My broad research area was on biogeochemistry and ecosystem modeling. Myself, Madhusudan Pal. My research is based on the biogeochemical processes operating in the Eastern Indian Ocean and their linkage towards global climate change. My name is Vijay Didya from IIT Delhi. 
I'm doing my PhD on the variability of uh, internal waves in the Andaman Sea. Internal waves uh, play an important role in determining the global ocean climate. So, understanding their variability helps in the sustainable development of our oceans. Myself, Anu. My research mainly focuses on studying the biophysical interactions of the North Indian Ocean, and this research fits in the productive and depredative ocean. My name is Damin. My area of research is marine benthic ecology, metal speciation, and metal accumulation in benthic organisms. My name is Lamza Hausito. I'm a PhD student in metal biogeochemistry. The kind of research I do fits in healthy and resilient ocean. My name is Kilambale Raja. I'm from Vishakhapatnam Port City in East Coast of India. I'm a junior research fellow in modeling of ocean waves. Hi, I'm Sharanya Jayendran. My broad area of research is metal biogeochemistry, mostly around India. I am Tom Elias. My broad research topic is physical model studies on geotextile breakwaters and I work for a safe and sustainable coastal environment. This is Jivaya Bodra and my research mainly focus on coastal hazardous currents such as rip currents which cause many drowning cases in many bits of the world. My name is Neeraj Prakash. My research is mainly consists of shoreline management, EAA and EEZ bathymetry. Our aim is to provide a sustainable engineering solution to the coastline all over the India. Hi, my name is Ajit Shammas. Um, basically, I am a marine geologist. Uh, right now, I am working with the coastal related issues. My name is Aisha Janet. I am working on modeling migration in coastal areas due to extreme events. So, I'll be contributing towards understanding the impact of climate change and environmental stress on population who are dependent on ocean. And my name is Sri Lakshmi. I'm researching on the climatology and the characteristic aspects of the swell peaks in the Indian Ocean. I am Vandana Gupta. I am working on coastal waters. My study interest is source and fate of pharmaceuticals and personal care products. This is Avanti Acharya. I work on the biogeochemistry of greenhouse gases not in the ocean, but the Indian Sundarbans estuaries, which are just as engaging and inspiring. Looking forward to exchanging ideas with all you early career professionals on the ocean out there. Thank you all for watching this um, uh, short video. And now we have uh, come to uh, the end of the session. Uh, may I request Derek Winko is to say a few words before closing this. Thank you very much, Francis. And let me also congratulate, uh, I'm sure Dr. Shetia is also very impressed with what, he's, what he saw with the ECOPS. I'll also let him, before we conclude, I'll also let him actually say a few words. And then I will actually finish, uh, you know, and close the meeting. Over to you, Dr. Shetty, please. Well, it, it was very nice to see the last uh, video, uh, just as an introduction of what the young researchers are doing around the country. It's a good, uh, uh, good clip to show on the occasion of the World uh, uh, Oceans Day, because I think very soon they, they are the ones who will be running the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shete. And all of us are, uh, you know, um, excited and uh, very, uh, you know, impressed with what we saw. Uh, and uh, congratulations to all of you. And then good luck with all the work that you do. And then you'll be contributing in, in a big way to the oceanography in the country. You know, the Ministry of Earth Sciences and all its institutions and several other agencies are doing a lot of work in oceanography. And then I'm sure you're in touch with, uh, you know, all these agencies and the scientists here. And, uh, you know, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shete. I'm sure most of them are impressed uh, with the kind of problems that you post on the shelf and, uh, you know, the slope, the oceanography in the shelf and the slope. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure a lot of them will take up this as a research work uh, in their future. And then if you need any data, uh, so INCOIS is the agency that you should look for. The ministry is putting all its efforts to enhance the ocean observing systems 
uh, in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, so I'm sure uh, these data sets will help us really, you know, come enhance our understanding of the Indian Ocean region. And to end, actually, a couple of comments on the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. All of us are very seized of this opportunity that we have ahead of us, 2021 to 2030, which has been uh, uh, identified by UN as the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So let's all, uh, all work together. And then there are opportunities for all of us to engage as scientists, as institutions, not only within the country, but across the whole globe, uh, you know, get all the all of us coming together and making sure we have a sustainable, clean, healthy, productive, predicted, and accessible and inspiring ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank I would like to thank INCOIS director and all of you for uh, supporting us. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Shetty. Okay. Uh, very nice way of organizing this program. I suppose if I were to come and give a talk, it would have taken me three days of travel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is uh, one of the you know advantages. Of course, we miss physically meeting each other and talking, but I think these virtual meetings have really uh, enabled uh, wider uh, interaction, I would say. Okay, see you then. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. Well, 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 but is the live stream that we have